I suspect that if I would ask you tonight where you're going to take vacation this summer or fall, you could probably tell me. But if you ask a typical Christian about eternal plans that God has laid out for us, you might not get such a clear-cut answer. Well, do you believe in the rapture? Yes, I believe in the rapture. You believe that at the rapture we're going to be caught up and meet the Lord in the air? Yes, I do. Where are you going to go? What? No, where? Where are you going to go? Uh, up. Up where? Um, up there. Where will you be? Uh, with Jesus. Where will he be? With me. <laughs> and we ought to know about eternity because that's where we're going to be forever and ever and ever. And tonight in our fourth study, this is chapter four of the book of Revelation, the coming universe as God sees it. I think I told you this story maybe the opening session, but I want to tell it to you again because it is, it's a powerful one. In the last uh, part of uh, the uh, 1800s, Queen Victoria reigned over the British Empire. She was on the throne for over 63 years. Can you imagine that? She was loved and revered by most of her subjects, not by all of them, but by most of them. And on one occasion she was speaking to the Archbishop of Canterbury, who's the head man of the Anglican State Church there. She said to him, I would so love it if Jesus would come in my lifetime. And the Archbishop said, why, Your Majesty? And Queen Victoria said, I would so love to lay my crown at his feet. In the Assemblies of God, we have 16 foundational tenets of faith. I've listed them for you there on page one, on line 13, 12 and 13. Jesus Christ is the savior of all mankind. Jesus Christ is the healer. Jesus Christ is the baptizer in the Holy Spirit. Jesus Christ is coming again. No question about that. We believe that his return will be in two segments. The first segment we know as the rapture. Well, Pastor, that word does not appear in Scripture, and you're right. But it means catching away. Both Thessalonians and in Corinthians, we are told very clearly God's plan for taking his people out of this world. Now, this is not an issue of faith. I have many friends who will, will differ here that we have good Christian fellowship with and I believe they're people of integrity, but there are different schools of thought on the rapture. Some believe that it's gonna happen halfway through the tribulation period of seven years. Some believe that it's gonna happen at the end of the tribulation. Others believe, as I do, that it will happen before the tribulation, and I think scripture makes an airtight case for it. We believe that the rapture is the next great prophetic event to happen, and there is no prophecy that yet needs to be fulfilled before Jesus comes. Nothing. The last major prophetic reality that took place was in my lifetime was in 1948 when once again the Jews began to return to Israel as Ezekiel wrote about so graphically in the 37th chapter of his great writing. They have returned and we're going to be studying a little bit more about that in subsequent weeks. But that was the last major one to be done. I cannot think of anything that Jesus mentioned in Matthew 24 and 25 there on the Mount of Olives, as he taught about the coming, his coming, the end time, there are none of those prophecies yet to be fulfilled. So Jesus could come at any moment. That's why we have to be involved in Russia. That's why we have to be involved in Light for the Lost. That's why we have to be starting churches in the United States. We have to be about our Father's business. It's the absolute ultimate priority of our existence. 
And some of you are saying amen, but I will tell you that many churches are not in line with that and think the idea of the church is to come in and have a good time and go home. But it isn't. Jesus said you are the salt and light of the whole world. And really the joy and fulfillment of knowing Jesus is to do what he says. It is somewhat strange to me the number of friends I have in pastoral ministries who have reached the point of what they call burnout. Wearing out is one thing, burning out is another. And sometimes I get worn out, but I hope to God I'm never burned out because I love every single day of working for the Lord. Even now in these days, I love working for God. It's more exhilarating, more uplifting than it's ever been. Why? Because we are involved in the great mission of our Lord, which is to take the gospel to everybody in the whole wide world. In our staff meeting last Monday, we talked about this. Are there any areas of our city, our county here, in which we are not infiltrating? We found one very glaring one that none of us had ever thought about, and we're working on that one now. But in hospitals, nursing homes, prisons, penitentiaries, uh, business places, marketplaces, the adult nightclubs, you name it, we have we have spies for Jesus Christ in all of those places because that's our job. It's our job. So the first segment will be the rapture, the next event in the prophetic program, and we are actually caught up to meet the Lord in the air. Don't believe the people who tell you they are Jesus or they are Messiah, and you can come and hear them speak at the convention center in Syracuse or in Boston or in San Francisco. They are not the Messiah unless they are hovering. <laughs> we meet the Lord in the air. Well, how do we know a fake Messiah from the real one? Check his feet. If they're on the ground, he ain't it. <laughs> we meet the Lord in the air. And then, Sometime after that, which we'll discuss, is the second coming when Jesus actually returns to this earth and we come with him. Now look at line number one. This is fun to me tonight. We've been studying history in chapters one, two, and three. Now we study the future. Revelation chapter four deals with the saints of God immediately after the rapture. Where do we go? What do we do? Chapter four tells us. You have the uh, scripture in front of you from 1 Corinthians 15, Paul's writing to the great Pentecostal church in Corinth. I'm going to take you to Corinth near the end of this study tonight. This is from the New Living Translation. Let me tell you a wonderful secret God has revealed to us. Not all of us will die. That's good news. But we will all be transformed. That's good news too. It will happen in a moment, in the blinking of an eye, when the last trumpet is blown. For when the trumpet sounds, the Christians who have died will be raised with transformed bodies. And then we who are living will be transformed so that we will never die. We who are living will be transformed so that we will never die. For our perishable earthly bodies <clears throat> must be transformed into heavenly bodies that will never die. When this happens, when our perishable earthly bodies have been transformed into heavenly bodies that will never die, then at last the scriptures will come true. Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where's your victory? O oh, death, where's your sting? For sin is the sting that results in death and the law gives sin its power. How we thank God who gives us victory over sin and death through Jesus Christ our Lord. So my dear brothers and sisters, be strong and steady, always enthusiastic about the Lord's work, for you know that nothing you do for the Lord is ever useless. I love the King James here, it says, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. 
In the middle of page two, you have a brief review. I'm not going over that with you. You can read it. Down to line 30, now we come to the incredible fourth chapter where we find all redeemed saints of the ages where at the very throne of God. So what's going to happen to us at the rapture? We're instantly going to be at the throne of God with every saint of God who's ever lived. You can follow there in the scripture reading. We'll turn on the video and you can hear the scripture read to you, if you will, Travis. After this, I looked and saw a door that opened into heaven. Then the voice that had spoken to me at first, and that sounded like a trumpet, said, Come up here. I will show you what must happen next. Right then the Spirit took control of me, and there in heaven I saw a throne and someone sitting on it. The one who was sitting there sparkled like precious stones of jasper and carnelian. A rainbow that looked like an emerald surrounded the throne. Twenty-four other thrones were in a circle around that throne. And on each of these thrones there was an elder dressed in white clothes and wearing a gold crown. Flashes of lightning and roars of thunder came out from the throne in the center of the circle. Seven torches, which are the seven spirits of God, were burning in front of the throne. Also in front of the throne was something that looked like a glass sea, clear as crystal. Around the throne in the center were four living creatures covered front and back with eyes. The first creature was like a lion. The second one was like a bull. The third one had the face of a human. And the fourth was like a flying eagle. Each of the four living creatures had six wings and their bodies were covered with eyes. Day and night, they never stopped singing. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord, the all-powerful God, who was, and is, and is coming. The living creatures kept praising, honoring, and thanking the one who sits on the throne, and who lives forever and ever. At the same time, the 24 elders knelt down before the one sitting on the throne. And as they worshiped the one who lives forever, they placed their crowns in front of the throne and said, Our Lord and God, you are worthy to receive glory, honor, and power. You created all things, and by your decision they are and were created. That's the song we sang earlier tonight. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor. I'll tell you what, I intend to be there when that service starts. <laughs> Amen. All right, let's do the commentary on the entire chapter, starting on page 3, line 24. John writes, after this, I looked. After what? Well, after all the things that had happened to him in chapters 1, 2, and 3. Jesus appearing to him on the island of Patmos there in the Aegean Sea. Jesus giving him the messages to the seven churches of Asia Minor. That's Turkey. That's the country of Turkey. And now our Lord is going to show John, according to verse 1, the things which must shortly come to pass. Verse 1 of chapter 1. Behold, look, look. He's staggering if we could see as God sees, if we could see the world as God sees it for 10 seconds, we would never be the same again. Oh God, let give me eyes. Jesus said, except a man be born again, he cannot see. Open up our eyes to see, oh God. A door was opened in heaven. 
Here John is given a VIP entree into eternity and he's shown the things that await us. The first voice I heard was as it were a trumpet talking with me. We read back in chapter 1 verse 10 that when John was back there on Patmos meditating on the Lord's day suddenly behind him he heard a voice it sounded like a trumpet. In all the 21 years I've been your pastor, one of the funniest things that ever happened to me happened on this platform on a Sunday morning. Now pastors are supposed to keep their dignity and, and never indicate that anything is wrong, but this was so funny, I, I almost never got it back. We had never at that time, Mike, had trumpets or brass. And back in those days, the, the configuration of the platform was different. The choir was there, but we had little tiny pews. Remember pews that sat right in front of the choir? And David Thomas never told me he was going to do this. He didn't have to. He runs a music department. And, and uh, Brad didn't know it. And Bill Camel didn't know it. And Eric Lewis, who was a junior high pastor, didn't know it. We were just standing up there. And all of a sudden, right behind Eric, a guy opened up with a trumpet. And I mean, he hit it hard. And it stunned us, because it's right behind us. Not out here where you are safely, it was right behind us. You saw him up there, we didn't even see him up there. And Brad and I kind of caught each other's eyes and we were fighting laughter. And we'd have made it except that young Eric said, I'm in so much pain. <laughs> the service was over for me at that moment. So that's the voice that you're, we're not talking about a soft little voice here. Jesus calls out again, come up hither. And John, didn't have to be told twice. And he hears the voice of Jesus and he's up there. And I will show thee things which must be hereafter. In other words, Jesus is going to show to John and to you and me in this study, God's master plan for the future, the coming universe as God sees it. Verse two, immediately I, John, was in the spirit. That means he was captured by the Holy Spirit his body wasn't there, but his soul and spirit were. And he was seeing in the spirit the things the Holy Spirit wanted him to see. That's not unprecedented at all in Scripture. Over and over throughout the Word of God, we read about the Holy Spirit opening someone's eyes, someone's eyes to see things that you wouldn't see in the flesh. Back in the 37th chapter of Ezekiel, I just mentioned you had that. Ezekiel was a captive, one of the Jewish captives over in Babylon about 550 years before Christ. That's Iraq. And one day the Holy Spirit picked him up and took him back over into Israel, some four or 500 miles to the west. And he's back in Judea, which is rugged country. It's brutally rugged country. And he's standing on the edge of a ravine. He's there in the spirit. And that's where he saw the vision of the dry bones which was one of the great prophecies that in the last days those bones would come back together. We've seen that in our lifetime. We've seen the flesh and the sinew covering the bones. But what we're about to see, and you will study this a bit later on in the book of Revelation, is when the Holy Spirit breathes life, spiritual life comes into Israel. The greatest revival the world has ever known is going to come out of Israel. We're seeing these things happen right now. A throne was set in heaven. Line 11, there are three heavens that we know about. There's the atmosphere, the air we breathe, 79% nitrogen, 20% oxygen. Uh, the other 1% a mixture of gases, unless you're in Los Angeles when that equation gets really messed up. The higher into the sky one goes, the thinner the atmosphere. 200 miles up is pretty much the limit of any vestige of atmosphere. You couldn't live in there without some hope but some help. The next level up we commonly refer to as space. 
Space is the stellar heaven, also known as the universe. Here are the stars and the planets and the constellations. The third heaven is believed to be the abode of God, the throne of God. So it's far beyond anything that even our strongest telescopes out on Mount Wilson, the Palomar Observatory, could ever begin to appropriate. Somewhere out there is the throne of him who created it all, God himself. Now what's happening to John in the spirit here is what will happen to every believer in spirit, soul, and body at the rapture of the church. I give you another scripture reference here, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18, this is line 28. Paul wrote to the church there at Thessalonica, that's way up in northern Greece, that's why it's called Thessalonians. The people who lived in Thessalonica, Thessalonica were called Thessalonians. People who lived in Philippi were called Philippians. So that's why we call these books by these names. I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them who are asleep, those who have died, already died. Here's what had happened in the church at Thessalonica. They believed Jesus was coming at any moment, but their brothers and sisters in Christ were dying, physically dying. Were they going to miss eternity? And the Holy Spirit says to Paul, no, explain to them that death will continue to happen to people until that time when Jesus returns. So he says, I don't want you to be uninformed here. That's a better word for ignorant. I don't want you to be uninformed here, brothers and sisters, concerning those who have died, that ye sorrow not even as others who have no hope. That's a colossal verse in godly funerals, Christian funerals. Yes, we mourn. We weep for our loved ones who have gone. To this day, I, I think about loved ones in my family who've been gone for 50 years, and I'll find tears stinging my eyes. God hasn't wiped away all the tears from our eyes yet. If you're ever grieving and some Christian comes up to, quote, help you and says, if you had faith, you wouldn't be grieving like that, in the name of Jesus, slap them. Verse 14, for if we believe, if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, well, let's check it out. Do you believe Jesus died? Do you believe Jesus rose again? Okay, if we believe that, even so, those also who sleep in Jesus, those Christians who have died, will God bring with him? For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them or supersede those who are dead. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Those who've died in the faith will be caught up. They've got six feet farther to go. So I guess they have to go first. I don't know what the physics of eternity is here. A good friend of mine uh, who is a pastor in this city, and we, we occasionally have coffee, and he, he really thinks we Pentecostals are nuts. I mean, he really does. He tries to be nice about it, but down in his heart of hearts, he really thinks we're crazy. And he said, you know, we know that our church is, and he actually said this to me, much more righteous than you Pentecostal people are, and would be the first ones in heaven. I said, I don't even question that. The Bible says so. Dead in Christ will rise first. <laughs> I have a question about that. Says it right there. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Comfort one another by these words. One sat on the throne. It's at this point that you and I are in the very presence of the living and eternal God. 
There was a marvelous interview of Billy Graham. And by the way, pray for Dr. Graham. He had surgery today. He's 89. That, uh, that God will raise him up. It's going to be an enormous loss when Billy Graham goes to be with the Lord, if indeed the rapture doesn't take place. <clears throat> he was being interviewed by, uh, by David Frost on BBC. And uh, Frost said, what's the first question you're going to ask God when you get to heaven? And Billy Graham said, you know, David, there are many questions that I have formulated down through these many years. Why do righteous people suffer? Uh, why doesn't God heal ev everybody? He said, I have all kinds of these questions. And he said, I, I have said all my life when I get to heaven, I'm so anxious to ask God these questions. But he said, you know, the nearer I get to the time when I'm actually going to be in his presence, I don't think any of those things at that point will matter enough that I'll take the time to ask him. I believe that. I have not seen, ear hath not heard, the things that God hath prepared. The old songwriter, I think I put this lyric later on in the notes, the old songwriter wrote, it will be worth it all when we see Jesus. One glimpse of his dear face, all sorrow will erase. So bravely run this race until we see Christ. Verse 3, he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone. I think our commentator on the video said carnelian. A well-cut jasper does not appear at first glance to reflect other light as indeed a diamond does, but rather to appear to be the source of the light. God who sits on the throne is not only the light, he is the source of all light. He's the one who torched the sun. Sometimes our evolutionary friends uh, like to kid us and they say, well, you have chapter one of Genesis. In the, in the beginning, God created the heaven. Let there be light. First creation day, let there be light. Sun wasn't created in your own Bible. Sun wasn't created till the fourth creation day. I'd explain that. Same way you explain later on in the book of Revelation when we get to it, when we get to the eternal city, the Bible says there's no need of stars or moon or sun didn't say there wouldn't be stars or moon or sun, just said they won't be necessary. Oh, it gives me goosebumps. Because God is there. He is the source of all those things. He is the light. Verse 15, there was a rainbow about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. The rainbow is the heavenly sign of God's mercy. I gave you the scripture reference there on Line 18 from Genesis 9, 11. This is the covenant that God made with Noah. I will establish my covenant with you. Neither shall all flesh be cut off anymore by the waters of a flood. Universal we're talking about here. Neither shall there be any flood to destroy the earth. And God said, this is the token of the covenant which I make between me and you, I do set my bow, my rainbow in the cloud, and it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. And it shall come to pass when I bring a cloud over the earth, a bow shall be seen in the cloud, and I will remember my covenant. Of uh, great significance here, we are, and I'll, I think I can prove this to you in just a moment, we as the saints of God, doesn't matter if you're a Baptist, Presbyterian, Roman Catholic, what, if you've given Christ your heart and life. We are, we're saved by the blood of Christ, not by our denomination. And we're all standing there around the throne, and there's the rainbow over the throne, which reminds us that the only reason we are there is because of the amazing grace of God. The rainbow is the constant emblem of God's grace. 
But look at line 33, when we get to the great white throne judgment, and this will be those who are not saved, not redeemed. These are the ones who are going to appear before God in what's called the second resurrection. You don't want to be in the second resurrection, I will just tell you. How will we know if we're in the second resurrection? You won't see a rainbow. Because God's mercy and grace will not extend to those who are in the second resurrection. They have rejected the means of salvation that God ordained on the earth, which is salvation through Christ. Revelation 20, verse 11 and 15, here come all the sinners of all time. I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. There was found no place for him, etc., 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 etc. You can read that through. What's missing? No rainbow. At the same throne in chapter 4, there's a rainbow. The saints of God are there at the throne. By the time the unsaved get there in chapter 20, no rainbow. Every person in this sanctuary is going to stand before the throne of God. Look for the rainbow. If it's not there, you just bought the farm for eternity. Verse 4, round about the throne were four and twenty seats. Now this is one of the greatest verses in the Bible. They're all great, but I, boy, I love this verse. Round about the throne were four and twenty seats, and on the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. Uh, I believe the rapture is going to take place before the tribulation. I believe with all my heart. Who's, who's the Antichrist going to be, Pastor? I don't know. In the 17 years I preached on the network for revival time, I got a million and a quarter letters from listeners. The two most often asked questions were, uh, what is the unpardonable sin? And I believe that's dying without Christ. And secondly, who's the Antichrist? I don't know. And I don't mean to be impertinent or rude, but I don't care because I'm not going to be here when he gets here. Two guys are talking on the street. One's a Christian, one's not. And one said, the non-Christian guy said, do you really believe the Bible? He said, yeah, of course I believe the Bible. He said, do you believe the story of Jonah and the whale? He said, well, it's a great fish. Yeah, I believe that Jonah was swallowed, swallowed by this great fish. And when I get to heaven, I'm sure you're going to ask him about that. And the other guy said, yeah, what if, what if Jonah's not in heaven? He said, well, then you ask him. This verse is incredible. Look at the box on page 6. Who are these 24 elders? This is written by Dr. Dwight David Pentecost, who is the dean, the, the, theme, uh, the, dean of the uh, Theological Seminary of Baptist University, Baptist uh, down in Dallas. Incredible man, great writer. I've collected his books for years. And I think I told you one time, I think God has this delicious sense of humor that a man considered to be one of the great scholars ever in the Baptist world is named Pentecost. What can I tell you, ladies and gentlemen? <laughs> Here's what Pentecost writes. These elders are significant because they are seated... Look there at verse 4 above you. On the seats I saw four and twenty elders. They are seated. They are robed. Back at verse 4. Clothed in white raiment. And they are crowned. And on their heads crowns of gold. In Ephesians 2, 6 we read that God has made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. As I get older, I passionately love that concept. He made us to sit, to sit. I've preached that to worship leaders all over America. Let the people sit down. It's not spiritual to stand. On the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit filled the upper room where they were, what? Seated. You want revival in your church? Sit down. 
Yeah, Pastor, you're just being facetious. Not really. In Revelation 19.8, it is stated, And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. The fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And again, Paul testifies in 2 Timothy 4.8, Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all those also who love his appearing. These considerations seem to identify the 24 elders as the church. Why 24? Some scholars seem to think it means the 12 tribes of Israel representation and the 12 disciples of the New Testament church. It's the Old and New Testament church represented there. It means you. It means you. If you love Jesus, you are there. You're in this group classified as 24 elders. Now when are they seen in heaven in their glorified position? At the very outset, the beginning of the tribulation period described by John in Revelation 4 through 19. They are already in heaven, seated, robed, and crowned. Therefore, the rapture must precede the tribulation. And furthermore, as we get into chapter 6 in a couple weeks... Jesus holds the book of God's judgment, this great scroll that is sealed with seven seals. And when Jesus, nobody else, when Jesus peels off that first seal, it's the release of Antichrist. Antichrist isn't coming till Jesus says he can come. It ain't Haines till Jesus says it's Haines. Think that one through. Antichrist can't come until he's released. And you are the bride of Christ. You're not going to be here when Jesus unleashes that beast on this earth. Look down at uh, line 21. This is from Revelation 3.10. God's promise to the faithful saints in the church at Philadelphia that we studied last week. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I will also keep thee from the hour of temptation which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. What a beautiful, powerful assurance to us who are in Christ Jesus through the new birth. We will not see the Antichrist. We won't even be on the earth when he comes. But the spirit of Antichrist is already here, just not the person. Verse 5, out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. He signal the power of God and indications of his wrath that it will soon strike the earth. And I write here, many professing Christians have such a low esteem or concept of God. Uh, gospel quartets sometimes sing, and it's okay, it's just terrible song. Have you talked to the man upstairs? He's not the man. He's God. Well, God's my partner. No, he's not. He's your God. I happen to like boxing very much. I'm sorry, I just do. I would have been a fighter professionally, except for two things, fear and no ability. I used to love to fight when I was a kid. And I still love to watch boxing matches. Just do. Pray for me, but I do. And I love it when the fighter, the, the winning fighter, is interviewed at the close of the match and his nose is laid over and his ears are twisted. <laughs> they say to him, what do you have to say? Well, I want to thank God who helped me beat this guy's brains in over here. <laughs> First Peter 3.15, this is line 13, sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. Be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason. Boy, I love that word reason. The gospel is reasonable. Isaiah 1.18, come now let us reason together, saith the Lord. 
How can you have faith if it's not based upon reason? Faith is substance. We have a reason for our faith. For every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. We are called upon to present God as he really is. I quote A.W. Tozier down here <clears throat> in that box. I never did read the box to you, but I, I want to read it to you. A box on page 7. This is A.W. Tozer, great Christian and missionary alliance statesman. He was the editor-in-chief of the Alliance Witness for years and years, one of the great theologians of our day, a man who spent six, seven, eight hours a day on his face before God every day of his life. This is what he wrote. The history of mankind will probably show that no people, group of people, has ever risen above its religion. Think about that. And man's spiritual history will positively demonstrate that no religion has ever been greater than its idea of God. No religion has ever been greater than its idea of God. I want to read that to you again. Let that sink in. Let the Holy Spirit cultivate that in your heart. My faith in God can never rise any higher than who I think he really is. Worship is pure or base as the worshiper entertains high or low thoughts of God. Without doubt, the mightiest thought the mind can entertain is the thought of God, and the weightiest word in any language is its word for God. That our idea of God correspond as nearly as possible to the true being of God is of immense importance to us. Do you know why idolatry, the, the very heart, the essence of idolatry is not just a statue on the dashboard of your car or a fetish in the corner of some hut in the jungle. The essence of idolatry is when you and I think of God as something or someone other than who he really is. I want to lay that one on you again. It is idolatry when you and I think of God as someone or something different from who he really is. Not some old white-haired bearded gentleman up over Mars somewhere. The Star Wars movies came out. May the force be with you. It's an insult to God. May the farce be with you. God is not some invisible force. I mean, he is that, but that's only one microcosm and a tiny little chip of his whole makeup. Who is it? How much about God do you really know? Do you ever study God? The more you know about God, and we can only know just a little bit, but God help us to know that. The more you know about God, the higher your faith goes into the sky. Pastor, we can't do this. How big is your God? When you begin to comprehend who God is, you know that as you give your children to God, God will take care of them. And when they're old, they will not depart from the way you trained them up to be. My God shall supply all your need. You think God's your local banker? You think God's the one who holds the mortgage on your house? My God shall supply all your need. How? According to his riches through Christ Jesus. Some of you are sick tonight. God designed your body. He's the master creator. Now, if you came from an ape, go visit a baboon. you got problems here. <laughs> but if you believe that God designed you, I believe that so passionately. God designed me. 
Ethel Waters, dear heart, used to say, God don't make no junk. When you start to comprehend who God is, your faith goes through the roof. Look at the underlined part there in that box from Tozier. I believe there is scarcely an error in doctrine or a failure in applying Christian ethics that cannot be traced finally to imperfect and ignoble thoughts about God. It's my opinion that the Christian concept, conception of God currently is so decadent as to be utterly beneath the dignity of the Most High God and actually to constitute for professed believers something amounting to a moral calamity. Again, Peter says, sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. The only God people in Southwest Florida most of them know anything about is the God they see in you. Did you ever stop to think about it? They don't read the scripture. It's hard to get believers. It's hard to get Christians to read the word. Then they wonder why they don't have any faith. The only God the people out in the world know anything about at all is the God they see emanating from you. So God says, for goodness sake, since you are the one who is revealing me to the people out there, show me as I really am, not some makeshift little cockamamie God out there. That's heavy. Bottom of the page, seven. Again, Tozier, perverted notions about God soon rot the religion in which they appear. The long career of Israel demonstrates this clearly enough, and the history of the church confirms it. So necessary to the church is a lofty concept of God that when that concept in any measure declines, the church with her worship and her moral standards declines along with it. The first step down for any church is taken when it surrenders its high opinion of God. Then you have the line on page six, and there were seven lamps of fire burning beneath the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Is there more than one Holy Spirit? No. John really, I believe here, is reflecting back on Isaiah 11 2. I'll read it to you. This is line 11. The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. And you can go in different directions with this, but we know at least Isaiah, for one, listed seven characteristics of the Holy Spirit. There aren't seven spirits, but he has revealed to us, there's not three gods, there's one God, but he's revealed to us in three ways through the Trinity. There's only one Holy Spirit, but... John is telling us, as did Isaiah, he's revealed to us in many ways, more than these seven, but at least these seven through the spirit of the Lord, the spirit of wisdom, spirit of understanding, and so forth. Verse 6, we get to the sea of glass like unto crystal. You can read that. We get to verse 7, we get to the great seraphim. These are types of angels. Massive, massive, massive angels. One has the face of a man, one has the face of a calf, one has the face of a lion, one has the face of an eagle, as you saw on the screen. They were way back in Isaiah, in the sixth chapter of Isaiah, Isaiah saw him when he went into the great temple in Jerusalem to mourn the death of good King Isaiah. He said, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, and above his train I saw these four massive angels. And he describes them exactly as John sees them. These are the four attending seraphim, types of angels. There are different kinds of angels. Four massive, six-winged, multi-eyed angels who always attend God and hover over him crying, Holy, 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 holy is the Lord. I get amused when I... Sometimes here people say, when I get to heaven, I'm just going to find God's throne, run down the street, and jump right up in his lap. No, you're not. As we've already seen, there's lightning coming out of that throne. You'll be a crispy fritter for eternity. <laughs> Those massive, massive angels that Six wings. Another silly song we sing. I can feel the brush of angels' wings. No, you can't. 
because you ever get brushed by a wing of one of these guys, you're going to be in South America, man. <laughs> How'd you get here, senor? I was brushed by an angel's wing. <laughs> Go down to verse 9. I need to wrap this up. Boy, the time goes so fast. Verse 9 to 11, this is celebration time. Here we are gathered around the throne with every believer of all ages. We're going to spend time now worshiping God. How long a time? I don't know because there won't be such a thing as time. Boy, does, does that just take your mind and turn it into a spaghetti. I think about Paul standing before the judgment seat of Christ, opening up all of the things he's brought to God, as 1 Corinthians 3 says we're going to. Here come, here come all the things Paul's bringing. Somebody standing next to me says, is he going to open all those? Yeah, I think so. We're going to be here a long time. No, there is no such thing as time. See, we can't even comprehend that. And we lay our crowns at Jesus' feet if we have any. Look at the bottom of page uh, 9, and if you'll bear with me for 8 minutes, I want to show you a video. In the 18th chapter of Acts, we learn of one of Paul's ordeals in Corinth. Paul stayed in Corinth the next year and a half teaching the Word of God. But when Gallio became the governor, he was a Roman. When Gallio became the governor of Achaia, that part of, of Greece, some Jews rose in concerted action against Paul and brought him before the governor for judgment. They accused Paul of persuading people to worship God in ways contrary to their law. But just as Paul started to make his defense, Gallio turned to Paul's accusers and said, listen, if this were a case involving some wrongdoing or a serious crime, I'd be obliged to listen to you. But since it's merely a question of words and names and your Jewish laws, you take care of it. I'm not going to fool with this. <clears throat> the place where Paul stood, still there, in Corinth. It's called the Bema, B-E-M-A. It was the reviewing stand. It was also the place where athletes would come to receive garlands. Every time we go to Corinth, and we'll be doing so again in May, God willing, one of the first places I want to take the people to is the Bema. And we stand there and we have a service. Because in 2 Corinthians 10.5, Paul says, don't you know that every one of us must stand before the reviewing stand of God, the Bema, as Christians to give an account for our Christian life. Are we even going to have any crowns to lay at Jesus' feet? They're not automatic with salvation. Read 1 Corinthians 3. Now, eternal life is, but not rewards. Rewards are earned. They come through discipleship. Do you really think you can slough off as a Christian and get the same rewards as Paul? Surely you jest. We know that there are going to be degrees of hell. There are going to be degrees of heaven. There are going to be degrees of rewards. There are going to be degrees of responsibility in eternity. Darlene and I have already petitioned God for Maui. <laughs> Brad wants a mockery. I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> he probably wants Wisconsin. That's where. So I'm going to take you to this beam of judgment. We always go there. This is several years back, and it's a little eight-minute teaching on the beam of judgment. I cannot think of anything more important to impart to your life than this is. So see if you'll grant me a few extra minutes. If you need to leave, I understand. But I really want you to see this video at the very place where Paul stood before Gallio to determine if he could be set free. You and I will stand before God in much the same way, one-on-one, -on -one, to determine if we have any rewards. Go ahead and roll it, Travis. For the church to shape up and be what they're supposed to be. In that third chapter of 1 Corinthians, Paul writes about the time when every one of us are going to stand before God as Christians for our audit. This is the judgment seat of Christ. And in the second book of Corinthians, chapter 5 and verse 10, he writes back again and he says, don't you understand, hasn't it yet sunk into you that we must all stand before what you're leaning against, the Bema judgment. Only it's not this Bema judgment, it's the eternal Bema judgment. Not only were disciplinary matters handled at this judgment with 
with uh, the Governor Gallio, but this was also a place where the great athletic champions came to receive their garlands and trophies. The champions would come and they would be judged not only on whether they won or lost, but they would be judged on how they did what they did. Their sportsmanship, their demeanor, their purpose, their attitude, their heart. You had to have a heart of a champion to get the garland handed down to you right here from the governor. So Paul says to all of us Christians, we're going to the beam of judgment of God the minute after the rapture takes place. Right after that, our first stop is God's bema judgment. The sinners won't be there. This is Christians. Paul wrote to uh, Timothy in 2 Timothy 4, he will judge the quick, that's the believers. You hath he quickened who were dead, and he will judge the dead, those who've never been saved. But the quick, the resurrected, the saved, the transformed, the newly born in Christ will stand before God at the Bema judgment. And all of our works as Christians will be tried as by fire. Paul said it will be categorized by gold and silver and precious stones, those things which fire cannot hurt, only refine. And hay and wood and stubble, which fire will consume. And we'll all be saved by the blood of the Lamb. This is not a reviewing stand to determine whether we're saved or lost. This will be a reviewing stand to determine whether we have any awards or not. The old hymn says, Will there be any stars in my crown when at evening the sun goeth down? And I wake with the blessed in that mansion of rest, that haven of rest. Will there be, will there be any stars in my crown? So every time I read 1st and 2nd Corinthians, the place that hits me the most is this place right here. Calvary, thank God for Calvary. We're saved by Calvary. But here's what motivates champions. Someday, someday, without Darlene to help me or Dr. Trask, our general superintendent, to help me, I'm going to be called out from the pack by an angel. And I'm going to be led right up here to this place eternally where Paul stood here historically. Dear God. But on that reviewing stand will not be a man, but God will be there. And God will say to me, show me what you did. Since you were saved, show me what you produced. Why you produced it. Did you pastor just for your own self-gratification? Did you preach just because you love to hear yourself talk? Yes, as a matter of fact. To a certain extent, every preacher loves to preach or they're no good in the ministry. But is that the thing that really drove us? If so, that's just hay and wood and stubble. And over here somewhere will be that altar with the fire and it will be consumed. The question will be, did I do what I did for the sake of Jesus Christ? That's the bottom line. That's the bottom line. We have gone through a lot to get here to Greece, you and I. But it's worth it to me today to stand here. Of all the places we've been, this is the place that moves me the most because it's future. Every place else we've been, including Calvary, is the past. The upper room is the past. Thank God for the past. That's our foundation. But this is what's just ahead. This Bema stand is ancient and will pass away. But the coming reviewing stand, that's the main one. And I'll stand there. You'll stand there. God will call your name out. Not to see if you were saved or lost. I repeat to you again, you wouldn't even be there if you weren't saved. But God will call you there to say, all right, now the books are opened. Let's see what happened in your life. Paul will stand before that reviewing stand. I always like to remember that when his book of life is opened, there'll be no record until you get to the road to Damascus where he found Christ. That means murder was covered by the blood of Christ. All the past is blotted out by the blood of Christ. So that's not going to be even brought to, to attention. God says, I've forgotten that. 
by an act of my sovereign will, I've blotted out your past, never to be remembered against you anymore. It's what happened since you were saved, since you believed. At First Assembly, we push strongly for giants of the faith. We're not interested in raising spiritual pygmies and people whose noses have to be wiped spiritually all the time. But we're there to build champions for God. Why? As a pastor, I am consumed by this thing, that I must prepare you to stand before God's beam of judgment. Someday, it will be you. It will be you. What will you say? All right, thank you, Travis. <clears throat> I repeat that 10th verse for you. The four and 20 elders, that's us. Fall down before God who sat on the throne and worship him forever and ever. And cast our crowns before the throne saying thou art worthy. The tragedy would be to be in that august place and have no crowns to lay at his feet. I repeat, Queen Victoria, to the Archbishop of Canterbury, I do so wish Jesus would come in my lifetime. I would so love to lay my crown at Jesus' feet.